Just before we get started with this video, I do want to thank the commemorative Air Force who helped make it possible. They worked with David, the writer who put this piece together, to help us get more information about the plane, get all of our facts 100% straight, and also provided the incredible B-roll that you are seeing in this video. So a big shout out to them. If you'd like to check them out, I'm going to include a link to their website below. And let's just jump in, shall we? We've discussed a lot of planes on this channel. Most of them accomplish some sort of historic feat for the first time, only to be outdone by the next model. For the B-29, though, that's not quite the case. Sure, later planes would fly faster and higher, and they would include more advanced designs and avionics, but no aircraft before or after has played such a significant role in world history. Though it initially looked like an expensive failure, the B-29 would become the deadliest airplane in human history within about a year of introduction, a title that it still holds to this day. It played a leading role in the Pacific Theater, and it is the only plane to ever drop an atomic weapon on an enemy target. So let's get into it. In the years before World War II, America's primary strategic bomber was the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. Officially introduced in 1938, the Flying Fortress was a competent aircraft, capable of effective bombing campaigns throughout Europe. Of course, by 1938, Hitler's aggression was an early indication of the likelihood of an upcoming war in Europe. In the Far East, Japan was also acting aggressively, invading China from their position in Korea and eventually taking much of China's northeast and east coast. The American military was well aware of the likelihood of war in both Europe and the Pacific, even if the official policy was isolationism and neutrality. Still, it was clear to the Army Air Corps commanders that the B-17, though well suited for combat in Europe, did not have the range to cover the vast distances in the Pacific theater. The B-17 maxed out at about 3,200 kilometers, but the Air Corps needed something with a capacity of over 4,800 kilometers. Due in large part to the influence of famed aviator Charles Lindbergh, the Air Corps issued a formal specification for a super bomber that could deliver 9,100 kilograms of bombs to a target 4,292 kilometers away at a speed of 640 kilometers an hour. Several aviation manufacturers submitted proposals, but Boeing already had something in the works. They had begun exploring a similar project a year or two earlier. Boeing presented their design, the Model 345, on May 11, 1940. By the end of the year, the Air Corps requested three flying prototypes with full airframes and assigned the project the designation XB-29. In 1941, the US officially entered World War II, officially upping the urgency of this project. The Army Air Force, which had just been formed through the AAC earlier that year, liked what they saw in the early stages of the XB-29's development, and they ordered 500 aircraft in January of 1942. Aside from the super bomber specifications, the plane would need a state-of-the-art weapon weapon system and a fully pressurized cabin, something that had never been incorporated into a bomber before. In fact, the first pressurized airplane was introduced just a few years before the B-29 project began. However, pressurizing a bomber was a much more challenging task, as the plane would need a weapons bay with doors that could open mid-flight while maintaining pressure throughout the cabin. Boeing knew from the start that all of these requirements were doable, but the main question was whether it could be completed on the AAF's ambitious timeline. If you've seen many of our videos about airplanes, you may have noticed that their development can take over a decade from ideation to official introduction. Under less pressing circumstances, the B-29 would have taken at least five years to produce. Instead, Boeing had to mass manufacture the aircraft while also fine-tuning it and working out all of the kinks. As World War II progressed, the need became more and more apparent. Boeing partnered with two other manufacturers, Bell and Martin, to build the superfortresses at four major factories throughout the United States in Washington, Kansas, Georgia, and Nebraska. The first prototype made its maiden voyage on September 21, 1942, taking off from Boeing Field near Seattle. The aircraft boasted what would become the B-29 signatures, a 43-meter wingspan, a fuselage with a circular cross-section, and a stepless cockpit design. 
The aircraft was 30 meters long, with a fuselage large enough for 11 crew members and an armament bay in the belly. The flight went smoothly, but it wasn't exactly a great indicator of the plane's ability. The prototype didn't include any armament system, making the aircraft much lighter and easier to get off the ground. The second prototype, fitted with a Sperry defensive armament system, made its first test flight on December 30th of 1942. Shortly after takeoff, though, the plane's engine caught fire and the flight was immediately halted. Just two months later, the same prototype took off from Boeing field for a fully manned test flight with disastrous results. Once again, the plane's engine caught fire, but this time it wasn't able to land safely. In fact, the crew contained the engine fire, but a separate malfunction caused a fire inside the plane's fuel tank. It crashed a short distance away, killing all 11 men on board and 21 civilians on the ground. The primary cause of these early disasters seemed to be the plane's right R3350 duplex cyclone radial engines. You see, immediately after takeoff, most planes are fighting to gain altitude, but with the B-29, the struggle was reaching a fast enough airspeed. Radial engines require a lot of airflow to keep them cool, and the plane's slower speed meant that the engines received less airflow, overheated, and caught fire. While the engine problem wouldn't be totally solved until after the war, a handful of interim measures were put in place to ensure that the plane flew without catching fire. The most critical engineering change was to place cuffs on the propeller blades, which directed cold air into the engine's intakes and then into the exhaust valves. Pilots were instructed to delay their ascent, instead maintaining level flight after takeoff until the plane reached a good cruising speed. While the B-29's max velocity was about 575 kilometers per hour, the pilots needed to hit 300 to 350 kilometers an hour before making an ascent. While the engine problems were most pressing, the early superfortresses faced enough mechanical issues to keep most of them on the ground. In late 1943, around 100 B-29s had been delivered to AF bases around the US, but only 15 of them were actually airworthy. Due to the intense production timelines, Boeing factories couldn't update the earliest models with the latest specifications. Like we mentioned earlier, most planes they have got this long period of testing and modification before they're ever delivered to the end user, but the B-29 didn't have that luxury. Changes had to be made on the fly after delivery. This became a problem in early 1944, as the AAF contracted modification centers were not well equipped to handle the workload and the scope of the requirements. After all, Boeing factory workers were the only aircraft manufacturers with any experience building such an advanced aircraft. So AAF General Hap Arnold took control of the production, recruiting 600 Boeing engineers from the Kansas factory to relocate to the modification centers. These engineers trained the mod center workers to apply the most up-to-date alterations. Within three months of Arnold involvement, Boeing and the AAF had completed more than 150 superfortresses, and the speed only increased from there. Once the design was finalized, the number of man-hours spent on a single aircraft fell from 150,000 to just 20,000. Over the next two years, from 1944 to 1946, the four factories would churn out about 4,000 superfortresses, with an additional thousand coming from two other manufacturers. However, before the B-29 was deployed in 1944, there were some questions about how exactly the aircraft would be used. Although the plane was inspired by the need for a long-range bomber in the Pacific, they were initially intended for use against Germany. There were no airfields in the UK with enough space for a group of B-29s, so they were plans for deployment to Egypt. However, it became clear that the more pressing matter would be Japan and the Pacific Front. To keep China engaged in the battle against Japan, FDR pledged that American B-29s would bomb Japan by spring of 1944. In return, Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek agreed to grant the Americans access to air bases in China. But the process of reaching those bases was long and complicated. The fully equipped B-29 has a range of about 5,200 kilometers, and the Americans didn't presently have a foothold in the Asia-Pacific from which to run supply drops to the planes in China. Instead, the superfortresses were based in British North India, where they had a steady flow of fuel and ammunition. In preparation for raids, the fleet would carry supplies over the Himalayas, or the Hump, to bases in southwest China, from which they would take off for their bombing runs. The first official B-29 combat flight took place in June of 1944, as about 75 of the planes based in India went on a bombing run of Bangkok, which was under Japanese control. Just 10 days later, 68 B-29s took off from a base in Chengdu, China, for the first 
bombing raid on Japanese territory since the Doolittle Raid of 1942. Most of these planes targeted Imperial Iron and Steelworks factories located in Yawata, but the attack was an utter mess. One superfortress was shot down with anti-aircraft guns, while two others were forced down or crashed. Perhaps most importantly, only one bomb accurately struck the target factory complex. This lack of accuracy would become a theme for the B-29 in the early months of the operation. At the time of these early flights, the Air Force was using a method called strategic bombing. Strategic bombing calls for high-altitude bombers to drop explosives on critical locations in a city, like the factory complex in Yawata. Other common strategic targets include water supplies or bridges. Not only could hitting a strategic target render a city incapable of support the war effort, but it would also spare civilian lives. This was the method employed throughout the Western Front, and the AAF tried to use it in Japan, but it just wasn't working. Despite double-checking every calculation, B-29 bombs consistently fell miles from their targets. It took months of failures and research to discover just what was causing this imprecision. The B-29 was a high-altitude bomber, regularly flying at well over 9,710 meters. At the time, the Americans knew very little about the conditions at this altitude in the Earth's atmosphere. But they were about to discover something that the Japanese themselves had learned just 20 years earlier. About 9.5 kilometers above Japan, winds regularly reached 400 kilometers an hour. This multi-direction jet stream made strategic bombing impossible. If the B-29s were going to successfully bomb Japan into submission, there would need to be some profound changes. Following the mostly failed sorties of late 1944 and early 1945, the AAF instituted two significant changes that completely altered the legacy of the B-29 and the direction of the war. First, air bases in China placed Japan barely within the range of the B-29's 4,800km radius. That may seem impossible if you look at the map, but keep in mind that Japan already occupied much of eastern China, and bombers needed fuel to safely return to base as well. To effectively bomb the entire country, Americans would need runways much closer to the island nation. So they moved into the Marianas Islands, a remote archipelago about 2,500 kilometers south of Tokyo. U.S. forces took Saipan, Tinian, and Guam in the summer of 1944 and immediately built five large air bases there. Now Japan's population and industrial centers were all well within the range of a fully armed B-29. The other meaningful change was the bombing tactics employed by the B-29s. Earlier we discussed strategic bombing tactics and the complications caused by the Japanese jet stream. That was when legendary American Major General Curtis LeMay stepped in. LeMay was a notorious military innovator, and he implemented a shift from high-altitude strategic bombing to low-altitude firebombs. Incendiary raids began with the bombing of Kobe City on February 4, 1945, and it immediately became clear that this new method would reap destruction unlike anything ever seen before. In fact, to this day, the firebombing of Tokyo on March 9th and 10th is still the deadliest bombing attack in human history, with an estimated 100,000 casualties in the space of just 24 hours. Despite that fact, the fire bombing of Tokyo would never be quite as infamous as the B-29's final major act of World War II, dropping the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 1943, a physicist named Norman Ramsey, who was working on the Manhattan Project, was tasked with finding a plane capable of dropping the two massive bombs that his team had developed. The bomb designs were called the Thin Man, which was long and tubular, somewhat like typical explosives, and the Fat Man, which was ovular and rotund. Ramsey determined that the only airplane capable of carrying and dropping either bomb was the B-29, which was still incomplete. However, the job would require some modifications, so Ramsey collaborated with AAF General Hap Arnold to order a handful of specialized superfortresses called silver plates. These modified aircraft were stripped of the typical armaments found in B-29s to save weight for carrying the massive explosives. They also included fuel injectors, reversible props, and a special weaponier section in the cockpit, which contained tools for monitoring the bomb's condition before it dropped. After another year of development on the Manhattan Project, and with the silver plate B-29s thoroughly tested, President Harry Truman gave the order. On August 6, 1945, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tibbetts flew a silver plate called Enola Gay to drop the first atomic bomb, Little Boy, on Hiroshima. Three days later, the plane Boxcar dropped the Fat Man on Nagasaki. Less than a week later, the war with Japan was over. The B-29 had effectively ended the war with its months-long bombing of the Japanese mainland. In the months following World War II, the B-29 went from the war's deadliest airplane to a PR tool and record marathoner. 
A handful of Air Force generals flew modified versions of the B-29 all over the world, regularly setting records for the longest non-stop flight, which still stand today. In October of 1946, Colonel Clarence Irvin flew a B-29 over the polar ice cap from Oahu, Hawaii to Cairo, Egypt, covering an astounding 9,422 miles in a single flight. The Superfortress's production was officially halted in 1946 as the final model rolled out at Boeing's Seattle factory that year. But that was not the end of the B-29 story. The Superfortress played a small role in the Korean War from 1950 to 1953, but it became clear that the bomber was less suited for this type of warfare. North Koreans had few clear targets, whether for strategic or firebombing. Plus, the USSR's introduction of the MiG-15 presented the B-29 with a formidable interceptor. Still, B-29s flew 20,000 sorties and dropped 200,000 tons of bombs throughout the war, primarily flying at night to prevent interception. After the Korean War, the B-29 gradually drifted into obsolescence. The Convair B-36 became the Air Force's preferred long-range bomber, and the B-50 filled in the rest of the gaps, such as long-range recon and air-to-air -air refueling. Though originally planned as the B-29D, the B-50 included some critical changes that improved on its predecessor, especially the inclusion of a new engine and a thicker aluminum frame. While it's often compared to the plane that spawned it, in reality the B-50 was a completely new plane that closely resembled the B-29. By 1955, though, the B-52 Stratofortress was introduced, effectively ending the involvement of the B-29 and its B-50 variant. All in all, the B-29 was a massive success and a considerable part of the American victory over Japan in World War II. That may seem obvious in hindsight, but that certainly wasn't always the case. When it was regularly catching fire and crashing, the B-29 looked like a massive waste of money. In fact, the B-29 project was the most expensive project of World War II, with a total cost of $3 billion, or $43 billion in today's dollars. In contrast, the Manhattan Project cost $1.9 billion, or about $6 63% of the cost of the B-29. The average cost of a single bomber was about $800,000 or about $11 million in 2020. In the end, more B-29s were lost to mechanical failure than enemy fire. The plane was so impactful in the bombing of Japan that the USSR even copied its design. When a handful of US pilots couldn't retreat to American bases after bombing raids, they continued northward and landed in Siberia. Instead of returning the plane to the Americans, the Russians took it apart piece by piece and did their best to reverse engineer it, coming up with the Tupolev Tu-4. Aside from its role in the war, the B-29 will be remembered for its innovations, the pressurized cabin, the remote-controlled gun system, and the stepless cockpit, to name just a few. Its influence can be clearly seen in the early Cold War bombers, notably the B-52, which took the Superfortress's dramatic wide, thin wings and turned it up a notch. Today, 22 B-29s are preserved across the world, all but two within the United States. Among this total are the Boxstar and the Enola Gay, the two planes which dropped the atomic bombs on Japan. Two B-29s are still in flying shape today, one called Fifi, which belongs to the commemorative Air Force, and another called Doc, which belongs to Doc's friends. You can catch a glimpse of them at air shows around the United States, and even buy a ticket to ride inside them. And I'd like to thank the commemorative Air Force for their collaboration on this episode. Please do check them out through the link in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.